my pleasure. Um, you know, the, I guess, David, the question for me is, um, you, you talked um, about uh, earnings downgrades. When we, when we think back to the, um, the slide of, the, um, of market performance, um, we saw the markets drop 30% back to a, a net loss of probably 20% uh, or so now. Um, is, your, is your base case, in fact, uh, that, that it's more likely than not that we've got further to go uh, in a downwards direction? Look, I think so. I mean, I think what I mean what we've happened. What's really happened is that the the markets declined as the reality of the coronavirus spreading from China to Europe to the United States um, uh, became evident, and also that the reaction of of policymakers was to go into lockdown. So the sort of thing that China, you know, when China went into lockdown back in late January, February, you know, the rest of the world was gobsmacked. They they couldn't believe that China could do such a thing, but it turns out we've all had to do that. And really, the markets bottomed uh, within a few days of New York and California going to, into lockdown, which basically confirmed that the US would at least suffer um, a, a sharp downturn. Um, and ever since then, the hope has been that those lockdowns would actually then start to flatten the curve and things could reopen up again. And so we're now at the point where, yes, it has flattened the curve and there's talk of reopening. And so all that good news about flattening the curve and potentially reopening, I think, is priced into the market. The next leg will be, well, what actually does that reopening look like? I mean, and again, the markets are now trading at PE valuations as high as they were before the decline in the markets. And so anything other than a speedy recovery, I think the markets are going to be vulnerable. And, um, you know, most state governors in the US is talking about a very slow um, a lifting of, of those restrictions and even in Europe, uh, you know, a slow lifting of those restrictions. So I think that's where the, the, the I guess, the, re 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 the, the reality check for markets will be is that things can't return to normal, you know, by May, uh, as, 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 as some have been suspecting. We're going to be in weakened conditions at least until, um, you know, even Treasury Secretary Mnuchin overnight said he thinks the economy, the restrictions can be lifted by August. Now, that's a long way. August is a long way away for the US to remain in some form of um, you know, social distancing for that, that amount of time. All right, and a, a final question. I'm conscious of time and we're, we're going to run over and, and, yeah. uh, and it's been fascinating and I'm, I'm happy about that. And final question is really, uh, David, then what element, um, if at all, um, does global insecurity allow uh, for a V or a U um, recovery? I mean, to what extent are you thinking about North Korea or, 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 or an aggressive China? Well, I mean, again, on the other issue going, you know, so when, when we get out of this, I mean, I think, you know, I, mean, it, I guess it depends who becomes US president next year, but obviously US, US uh, tensions with China have been resumed. Um, we could see a resumption of those sort of tensions uh, next year. So that's another risk factor, even as we come out of the virus. Um, we're also seeing, you know, tensions with uh, Iran again, uh, picking up again. Um, you know, Donald Trump seems to be, you know, wanting to, um, you know, pick fights again and uh, and maybe create a bit of a diversion, um, which is not not particularly uh, not a, a positive environment for, for markets as well. So, you know, we do, you know, end of the day, we do still face the erratic behaviour of um, of uh, President uh, Trump and his uh, influence on markets, so which is. Um, you know, we've learned to live with it, but every now and again, he, he comes up with a, yet another incredible thing that we need to digest. So just another risk factor we need to deal with. Right. Look, David, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, present uh, to no us No worries, today. good to be with you. And, um, and in fact, it's a, it's a perfect segue into our final session, both for today and for our, uh, and for our roadshow. We heard at the start of today um, Chris Wrightson from Ironbark and Nick Avery from FinClear talking about the role of the investment committee in the decision-making process. We've just heard David Bass and AC talking about a set of market conditions which are probably more challenging than almost any of us have lived through, um, including the GFC. Um, and now we have, um, we're fortunate enough to have two of the most experienced portfolio managers um, from a licensee uh, mode and, and research house join us. So Shane Hawke from Oriana 
and, and Lucas de Corbe, Chief Investment Officer of Lonsec, probably have more experience between them than almost any two other people in terms of putting together portfolios that are then going to be used by advisors to give advice to mum and dad. And so it's a pleasure for me um, to introduce both Shane and Lucas to this session to talk about what does it mean to run an investment committee? What does good governance look like? What does good, good practice look like? Um, so thanks very much for joining us, Shane and, and Lucas. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Toby. So yeah, it, it is um, a, a, a very interesting time in global markets. Um, and it's a very challenging time for the world, full stop. Um, I think this session that we have here around professional portfolio management, what do licensees need to have, is a really important one to think through um, what can you do, um, how can you continuously improve and evolve uh, your value proposition to your clients um, in, in an environment that is just so challenging like we're facing. So obviously very fortunate to have uh, Lucas with me today and we're going to have a conversation just on some of the things that we can go through uh, to, to look to, uh, to put those into place and, and learn from some of the challenges that we're facing right now. So um, we've got a few questions that we can go through and Lucas will just have a conversation on those and, and um, try and illuminate some of the issues for uh, the audience. So. Uh, the first one was really what does best practice um, look like for the governance of uh, the portfolio management process? Um, look, and I think there's, there's, there's no sort of one sort of perfect model in terms of what is best practice. But, you know, we've gone through uh, our own process of sort of, you know, you have that constant sort of navel gazing and sort of saying, where, where can you improve? What, what, what in terms of getting towards, uh, you know, best practice? And I think... And particularly in this environment where um, there is, as you say, a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of news in the market, uh, this is where really your governance processes come to, 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 to fruition, I think. Um, so if you think about managed accounts, and really not even managed accounts, just any sort of investment uh, governance framework, um, but let's, let's think about managed accounts. And I think from, from our perspective, and certainly working with a range of dealer groups, um, it starts off with the basics. So, you know, and there's a range of groups out there, but I think um, having clear documentation, uh, understanding, you know, starting with, with the very sort of first element of a clearly articulated investment philosophy, a clearly artic articulated investment process, um, what are those things that um, really fundamentally believe in from an investment perspective and how do then you go about executing on that uh, from a portfolio perspective and really then the framework around that so the investment committee is very important uh, which is the sort of uh, typically the you know the, the formal body responsible for uh, for making those um, investment decisions um, and then having you know within that investment committee I think having a clear charter uh, as to the roles, the responsibilities, but even more importantly, I think is the composition of that investment committee. Um, now, there's no sort of one size fits all approach, but I think uh, if, if I sort of think about it, diversity, and what do I mean by diversity is diversity of thought. You want a, an investment committee where you're having different views um, uh, to really have a robust debate. Uh, you also need um, uh, having the right experience. So depending on what, what, what your investment approach is, ensuring that you've got the various different uh, people on that in com committee that have, have experience. Having independence is important as well. Uh, and um, to challenge the status quo, because again, if you're running an investment committee within, a, within your own confines, um, you can get very comfortable. So having uh, an external uh, element, an independent element on your own investment committee one, to challenge your views, to provide other views uh, is, is, is important. Um, but I think fundamentally, and I think about this environment specifically, um, having a clear, within that investment committee, having a clear uh, framework is very important, particularly environment where there is a lot of news and that news is changing day to day as we, 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 we can see at the moment. 
and it can lead to, you know, making reactive decisions, um, you know, conversations being, uh, so, you know, going down these rabbit holes of, you know, what's happened in news overnight. So having a clear framework can really help nav navigate uh, this type of environment and really allow you to focus in on, on those things which you think are important, be it, you know, whatever that may be, whether it's valuations, whether uh, liquidity markets, wh whatever it may be. But I think, you know, there's some high level things. And then finally, you know, how, how the size size of, a, of an investment committee. And I, again, I don't know what the right number is, but there's different interesting studies out there. I think um, uh, the Boston Consulting Group did a study, not specifically on investment committees, but on boards. And they found that once you get a board that's beyond the seven, in terms of numbers, that the efficacy in terms of decision making decreases uh, after that point. So I think it's just getting the right balance between having the expertise uh, and not being so big that you just become a sort of uh, ineffective in making your decisions. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's interesting. Um, it does start with the, the practices beliefs, doesn't it? In terms yeah. of um, what is it that um, they, they intrinsically believe is um, appropriate for their specific client segment. And ultimately there's different ways to, um, to manage money. But what, what's important is that it's documented. Um, it's clear. And then there's a, a philosophy that has got some evidence to demonstrate that this will add value for, for the, for clients. So starting with that real mission and objective, I think is really important. Um, you highlight the, the importance of the um, the investment governance com component of the committee, um, and it is very much about people um, having uh, diverse skills of people um, having the processes there and the consistency of that from an end to end perspective. And one of the things I've I've really seen over this last um, period of time is it's it's not just about the investment committee; it's an end to end service and value proposition that, that advisors are providing and clients are, are receiving. Um, and, and what's important is that that consistency is, is uh, fulfilled and implemented effectively, efficiently, and then an important and probably what I'm seeing is being critically important at the moment is communication. So ensuring that that communication comes to the client in a consistent way and in a timely fashion and through uh, the innovation of um, different technology and um, managed accounts generally, I think it's a very effective way to be able to provide um, clear and concise outcomes for your clients, which is based on what your beliefs and your practices beliefs are. Um, but it does come back to the people, the processes and the systems that you've got. And um, I think it is a case as well of really trying to um, be aware that there's the investment governance component and then there's the investment expertise and ensuring that both are kind of working together to ensure that you, you really are tapping into that. Um, and as, a, as an advisor advice group, you're, you're then able to um, tap into what you need to fulfill that end-to-end -end solution. Um, so it's, a, it's really been quite pronounced this last quarter how important each and every part of that full process is. Um, and, but it does start the beliefs and, and it really does end with the communication effectively to, uh, to clients. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you see that there's one particular approach that's appropriate um, for managed accounts in terms of managing money? Uh, look, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's one approach. I think though what managed accounts allow um, advice groups to implement, which maybe a traditional model portfolio doesn't, um, are things like dynamic asset allocation. So, um, so I don't, I'm not saying that that is the one, you know, better or worse, but it, it does allow you to, to um, I guess, um, use a, a wider variety of, of investment tools uh, because of the imp implementation benefits uh, via the managed account structure. So I don't think there's one approach. I think at the end of the day, you've got to sort of manage the portfolios in terms of, what your beliefs are and, and, and then ultimately what your own skill set is um, and, and align that to the approach. So 
I think, you know, there's different approaches that have their day in the sun and that do uh, better in some environments than others. But um, it's more important that you, that the approach aligns to one, your beliefs and two, it aligns to the skills you have. So if you do have skills in, in whether it's stock selection or uh, whether it is dynamic allocation or, you know, whatever it may be, that there's an alignment with that um, in terms of, your philosophy um, uh, and then how you execute that. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. I think it's, um, it is a function of, of obviously the pr practices, beliefs and philosophies, but um, an interesting as well is that today's world, there's so many more, there's so much more complexity uh, potentially that's available. Um, and, and so it's really um, an, an opportunity, but may not necessarily be that, that, uh, um, you need to explore and utilize that complexity that's available. So, um, for instance, the turnover or, or, or getting um, uh, different types of investments, um, it, it really does come back to what your philosophy and what your view is. And so, therefore, um, it, it really is important to think about what's important for your clients and, and for you in, in relation to effectively utilizing that. And then just going through that process of, uh, of the governance and the expertise um, to make sure that you've you've got that because clearly in a more um, dynamic um, and, a, and a one that's utilizing more alternatives and, and differentiated asset classes um, the complexity does increase which which therefore increased the uh, the investment cost in terms of the research and the governance that you should overlay on that so it is it really is important to make sure that it is fit for purpose for your your advisor, uh, advisor group, um, but also importantly, your, your clients. Um, what we, we talk about in terms of this, this session, um, uh, professional portfolio management, what does that mean to you, professional portfolio management? I think ultimately sort of having that fiduciary um, hat off um, and, and ultimately is, you know, whether you're a financial planner or, um, you know, managing portfolios, I think that's an important starting point that you ultimately, uh, you know, managing money on behalf of other people and, and that their interests should come first and foremost. And so I think having that mindset um, and then everything in terms of being professional, I guess, then everything that we've spoken about, um, having the processes, having the, having not only from a governance perspective, but uh, from an implementation perspective, and as you mentioned, from a communications perspective, um, you know, all those things sort of uh, uh, build, I guess, professionalism. But I think if you take it down to its most basic element is, um, you know, acting in the best interest of the client, having that fiduciary hat on, um, I think that's a, not a bad starting point. And then obviously, as you would expect, having the right experience and, and, and systems and all of those things. Um, I, I think that's where it sort of, you know, that, that builds off, off that starting point. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd agree. I think, um, I think it's an evolution of, of, uh, of, of uh, what effectively we, the industry has been doing um, and it's just continuous improvement, really. Mm -hmm. Um, like any industry would would face, and um, I think there's different types of uh, um, of ways to look at this. There's compliance, then there's governance, and a, and a term we're referencing is best practice stewardship. Um, so compliance, really looking at that, making sure that um, you're doing all the right things. Governance, looking at it more strategically. Have I got the uh, processes in place? Is it well governed? Is there oversight? Is there appropriate um, challenge? As you've said. Um, and prefer preferably independent challenge. Um, but then the best practice stewardship is, is going to that best interest point, which is, is, is no doubt there. It's just how can that continuously evolve? So that, that's really looking at the people, policies and processes and systems and really asking yourself, have, have you got um, abs absolutely everything you need to fulfill that best interests um, obligation yeah. and that what we call the, you know, is that best practice stewardship. And it's, I think it's just a continuous path to, to, to look to go that path. And the, the managed accounts um, and, and these uh, types of services are absolutely helpful in relation to um, assisting with formalizing and putting some structures around that. 
um, because um, yeah, it's just a it's just a um, I think just an evolution. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, I think that you know, if you sort of dig one sort of level down, I think things like uh, implementation is a good example. Where you know, so there's how do you what is the implementation process in terms of manager account? It's probably an area that you know some needs a lot of focus. I think. Um, what are the policies around that? How do you manage um, conflicts as well? Like if you're effectively managing money, um, you know things like restricting stock trades within the organisation. If you are making trades, all of these things are important, and I think are a positive thing in terms of really professionalising. Um, the managed account space. Uh, and I think the other thing we are, just that as a general observation, I think certainly in the sort of um, SMA structure where you've got an RE there, um, I've certainly observed uh, over the last several years a higher barrier to entry um, in terms of, you know, not only good governments, but the overall professionalisation of that area, which is a good thing. It's a good development. Because it means that the uh, the sector's sort of, um, if you like to say, maturing um, uh, in its professionalism. So, with that in mind, and I'm conscious Toby is on the line, so maybe I'll I'll stop and, and throw to Toby. Yeah. Oh, look, uh, no, no, thanks, Shane. I, I just wanted to feed in a couple of questions which have come from the um, the attendees. Um, uh, one of them is the issue that a managed accounts, unlike you know a managed fund or in particular, um, you know, an industry fund. Managed accounts are delivered through an advice process and are much closer to the client to advise or interface. So to what extent do you think the investment committee needs to have regard to or take into account um, the, the views or attitudes of the advisors who are going to be delivering the outcome of the, the managed account um, decision making? Maybe, maybe, do you want me to kick that off, Shane? Or, sure. I think, look, I think one important element, and Shane alluded to it in his earlier comments, is the communication piece. So I think if advisors are using uh, of a, a managed account, whether it's a deal group managed account or an external managed account, being very sort of um, um, close to, to, to the philosophy and aligning and being aligned to that is important. So what we find is even like if we look at advisors that, that we work with, initially a whole conversation is around, uh, is your investment philosophy aligned to how we think of the world? Because that's very important. Because that makes the conversations then with the end clients a lot easier um, when there are sort of portfolios, you know, changes or, or, or how the portfolios perform. But the communications piece is the critical piece. Um, so keeping uh, ensuring that advisors are fully informed when there is a change and the rationale and and so forth, because ultimately the clients do have visibility in what's in their portfolio. And I think unlike a managed fund, that communication element is, uh, uh, amongst other things, one of the most important things, uh, because yes, there there is a, a lot more closeness between what's happening in the portfolios, the advisor and the end client. Mm. Yes, and, and then there's a related question to that, I think. Well, I think it's related, um, which is sort of Shane to, to you because you, you do work in a licensee with a, quite a large number of planners. Um, uh, what, are the, what have you learned about sort of facilitating managed account um, into, a, into a practice with sort of a diverse range of um, a, advisor um, uh, perspectives. Yeah, look, I I'll probably comment more generally, um, Toby. Just you know, yes. from an industry perspective, um, uh, with that particular question. So, um, just looking generally at the um, different licensee groups, I I think it's um, I think it does come back to the the, the beliefs um, and uh, making sure that um, people are engaged and are uh, along that journey with the, the practice because ultimately um, in, in many different businesses there will be people that have a, um, a view around um, index versus active management, strategic versus dynamic um, and, and I think we need to recognise that um, you know, the advice community has been going for a long time and people have some well and great views and 
um, justified views in relation to the way that they put pork lives together. So I think it's really important to recognise that there is not necessarily one particular way, but um, it, it's also important to make sure that people are going along that journey and share that uh, philosophy with which is being described or, or there is sufficient flexibility uh, to enable um, advisors to uh, select a, a range of solutions which are more aligned. So it's, um, I think it's a really important piece um, to make sure my, my comment would be to bring everyone along that journey and make sure everyone's feeling engaged with uh, the philosophy and the beliefs and potentially have some flexibility there. Um, because, um, you know, it is critical in relation to, A, you know, people believe and think it's an appropriate outcome, but also in terms of communicating, as we've highlighted, with clients um, and, and supporting the use of the solution, um, it just provides a, a more fruitful outcome uh, for the investors. Right. Look, Lucas, Shane, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure for me to um, be able to host you um, in this session in what is absolutely a, a central part of the way in which uh, managed accounts are becoming central to the delivery of advice. Um, so to those of you who've attended, thank you very much for your time. Um, all of the sessions are recorded and will be available um, uh, already the first couple of days are available on our website. The, these will be available in a day or so. Uh, CPD will be issuing the CPD certificates um, early next week, uh, once we've collated who attended which sessions. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure for us to take the roadshow from live to virtual. We've learned a lot from that. Um, and uh, I hope you've found it worthwhile too. Lucas, Shane, thank you very much. To all our other presenters, thank you. And we look forward to you joining us again uh, next week for the Portfolio Management Group or, or, or uh, LOMSEC's webinar and to other future IMAP events.